Recently, there was a news that Poland has always been at the forefront of anti-Russian sentiment, and they have steadfastly supported Ukraine since the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. When the Germans sent helmets, Poland started sending tanks. Recently, the Polish government proposed a new idea. Polish President Duda met with Zelensky and the Lithuanian president and proposed that the three countries establish an alliance. If an ally is in trouble, the three will support each other. Everyone knows that this is actually an anti-Russian alliance. In fact, Poland proposed the idea of establishing a federation of the sea over 100 years ago, called Intermarian. It seems that this is about to be realized. What kind of organization is this federation of the sea? How was it proposed back then, and why was it not realized? Let's talk about it today. Poland's ancestors were once powerful. The Polish cavalry not only saved Vienna but also captured Moscow and brought Tsar Vasily IV to Warsaw for a surrender ceremony. King Sigismund III was so happy that he even gave the Tsar food. However, the country's power declined after the 18th century. The town of Pinkso, which was once independent, was partitioned by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. After Poland's destruction, the people started a movement to regain independence for over 100 years. In 1830, the November Uprising broke out in Poland, and the insurgent army elected a Polish diplomat, Klepiki, as the president of Poland. During his term, he outlined a vague future map of Poland. The new Poland was a huge federation, including not only Lithuania but also the later Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Romania. However, since the November Uprising was quickly suppressed, this map became a pipe dream. Although Klopiki's plan failed, his ideas remained. In 1904, the Russo-Japanese War broke out. Pilsudski, the future father of Poland, who was the leader of the Polish Socialist Party in Tokyo, witnessed the whole process of Japan defeating Russia up close. Inspired by the Japanese in Klopiki, Pilsudski proposed a plan to split Russia and rebuild Poland. The Prometheus Plan was proposed in Pilsudski's mind. It appears that the vast territory and large population of the Russian Empire made it impossible for Poland to compete with it, relying solely on its current territory. The only way to achieve Poland's revival was to incite the non-Russian ethnic groups living along the Baltic Sea, Black Sea, and Caspian Sea coasts to each independently gain their own independence. In 1917, the October Revolution in Russia and the collapse of the Allied powers the following year led to a rapid development period for the Polish army. During the process of withdrawing from Poland, the German army left behind equipment and troops for Pilsudski, providing him with the means to upgrade and expand the military. The Prometheus plan aimed to upgrade the military to establish a maritime federation, which included the Baltic Sea countries of Finland, Belarus, Ukraine, Hungary, Romania, and Yugoslavia, with Poland at the core, in order to prepare for any threats from Russia. At this time, Poland actually had two different plans for establishing a new nation. One was proposed by Dimoski, which aimed to create a single nation-state. He believed that the nation-state had become a trend in the times, and that minority groups within Poland needed to be assimilated. The other plan was the Maritime Federation proposed by Pilsudski, which also had historical roots in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Polish-Lithuanian Union. Both plans drew on Poland's historical and cultural traditions, but the difference was in the national identity. The former represented a popular and modern perspective, emphasizing national unity, while the latter viewed the country as a form of autonomy and federation, as a political community. Today's Republic of Poland is more similar to the former plan. However, at that time, Dombowski's ideas did not receive approval under Pilsudski's leadership, so the newly formed Poland was not able to establish a national state, but instead put the Intermarium plan on the agenda. In order to achieve this goal, Pilsudski decided to occupy as much territory as possible from Ukraine, Belarus, and other places during the Russian October Revolution and the Soviet Civil War. At the same time, he worked hard to build good relationships with newly independent countries such as Hungary, Romania, and Yugoslavia, and exerted influence on the three Baltic states. If possible, he would rebuild the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. To achieve this, Pilsudski began to prepare for war, and in 1918, he sent troops to capture the key city of Lviv in eastern Ukraine. In 1919, he occupied the capital of Belarus, Minsk, and the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius. Seeing Poland being drawn into the struggle for the remnants of the Russian Empire, the Allied powers immediately recognized Pilsudski as the legitimate leader of Poland, hoping that he could team up with the leader of the White Army in Ukraine, Denikin, to strangle Soviet Russia in its cradle. However, just as the Poles and Denikin were gaining ground, Pilsudski ordered the Polish army to stop advancing and wait in place. The reason was that he didn't want to see the White Army win so easily, because any kind of Russia posed a threat to Poland actually. It was better to let them fight among themselves. Pilsudski's actions greatly disappointed the Allied powers led by Britain and France, considering the idea of the Intermarium Plan. 
They believed that the Poles were intentionally preserving their strength to build a military alliance that could rival Britain and France. As a result, the Allies would not support the Intermarium Plan, and Poland would lose the recognition of the world's major powers. Furthermore, the other countries in the Intermarium Plan were not united and had deep territorial disputes. For example, Poland's occupation of Minsk and Vilnius angered Belarus and Lithuania and Romania annexed Hungarian territory after World War I, which led to enmity between the two countries. As for the deep-seated animosity between the various ethnic groups in the South Slavic region, it made it impossible for them to stand together in one trench. With so many contradictions, Poland could not reconcile them. Therefore, the Intermarium Plan was not put on the agenda and was on the verge of collapse. The subsequent Polish-Soviet war dealt a heavy blow to the Intermarium Plan, due to Polsudski's strategy of sitting back and watching the Tigers fight. The Red Army regained the initiative in the war. After defeating Denikin, the Red Army launched a major counteroffensive that led to one defeat after another for the Polish army, causing them to quickly lose control of Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. The situation was only barely stabilized during the Battle of Warsaw. In 1921, the Soviet-Polish peace treaty resulted in most of Ukraine and Belarus being given to the Soviet Union, making it unlikely for the Mizamors Federation to expand to the Black Sea. Furthermore, Poland gradually improved its diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, making it unnecessary to form an alliance. As a result, the Intermarium was dead. The small countries of Central and Eastern Europe each signed treaties with England and France to ensure their security. Later history tells us that Pilsudski's idea was correct. When Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union began to expand into Central and Eastern Europe, England and France watched from the sidelines while the small countries were powerless to stop the invaders. If there was a large country like the Intermarium, maybe it could have balanced against both Poland and the Soviet Union and prevented the fall of Poland. When Poland fell, an exile government was established in the UK, and this Intermarium concept was mentioned again in the 1990s when Poland. The Czech Republic, Hungary, and Slovakia established a four-country economic and military alliance in Visegrad. Coincidentally, there was a historical basis for this alliance. As early as 1335, the kings of Hungary, Poland, and Bohemia jointly signed an anti-Habsburg alliance in Visegrad. Even if they all joined NATO later, this group did not dissolve. Whether it's the Intermarium, Visegrad, or today's new Intermarium, the core idea is that small countries band together for warmth. Nowadays, Russia is playing the same game as it did in the 18th and 19th centuries, engaging in external aggression against Poland. So the idea of the Intermarium is once again being brought up as a way to counter the Russian threat. 